Welcome everyone. My name is Lisa Palmer. I'm the Institutional Repository Librarian at UMass Medical School. And today we're going to talk about access and impact as it relates to research data. And I would first like to thank my colleague Rebecca resnick Allen for her input and um, her contributions to the slides. Here's what I'll be covering during the presentation. Um, first, open access, because understanding the open access movement is a good basis for understanding why data sharing, which will be our second topic, um, has become a common requirement um, in scholarly communication. Then we'll finish about, with information about how to track the impact of research data. So open access. By definition, open access is free, unrestricted online access to uh, scientific and scholarly works. Um, as articulated by Peter Suber and other open access, open access advocates, the basic idea is to make research literature available online without price barriers such as subscriptions, licensing fees, pay-per-view fees, and without permission barriers such as copyright licensing embargoes. Um, and by products, so initially um, we were talking about papers, about literature, but now that's expanded into um, other products, posters, conference, abstracts, uh, and data, as you'll see. Um, so the movement toward open access came about in response to changes in the technical environment of scholarly communication in the early 1990s, things like um, email, the internet, which have radically changed the way we communicate. Um, the formal definition that's on the slide came about in about 2002, and since then there's been consistent growth in um, open access repositories, open access journals. And today, open access is recognized as a mainstream approach um, to delivering scientific communication. The um, Open Access Explained video from PhD Comics provides a great explanation of open access in just over eight minutes. We're not going to uh, do, uh, show that now, but I mention it because it's quite an accomplishment since open access is a really complicated and polarizing issue. Um, stakeholders have, you know, uh, in scholarly communication, have many different viewpoints. And that's because of the complexities um, in the culture of scholarly communication and how it's transforming in the digital age. Um, you know, in the print world, scholars, they traditionally signed over their copyright agreements to publishers without question, didn't read their, their copyright transfer agreement, and now they continue to do that um, because it's more convenient and that's what they're used to, but um, the environment's changed and it's not in, really in their best interest for them to do that. Now there are a lot more options of what they can do with their electronic articles. Um, open access is also complex because of the question about who pays, the economic issues, um, and what's the effect on publishers, on the public, on researchers, on academic institutions, on funders. Um, another complicating factor is that um, promotion and tenure is tied to publication, especially in high impact journals, and that process has proved to be very resistant to change. Um, scholars in particular have diverse views about open access and how it relates to prestige um, and quality. So my point is that open access is a complicated model and the practicalities of implementing it are challenging. What are the benefits of open access and why do people um, feel so strongly about it? Um, first of all, open access enables broad and rapid global dissemination of research. It informs the public and it expedites the scientific process. Um, this is in contrast to the reach of subscription content um, available to many of us in academia, which is limited to those institutions mainly in developed countries that can afford the subscriptions. Um, this quote from Dr. Hong Yu, who's a professor at UMass Medical School, articulates the societal impact of open access. She um, is a researcher in information retrieval and abstraction, and data and text mining are crucial to her research. And um, she couldn't do that without open access. A second benefit 
of um, open access in, is increased academic impact. When research articles are freely available to be downloaded, read, and reused, they demonstrate greater impact than articles locked behind subscri subscriptions because they have increased visibility, visibility, dissemination, and receive more citations. There have been a lot of studies by this about this, and the vast majority confirm those findings, although there are a few um, that do not. The tenant uh, article that is uh, referenced on the slide, um, which is a great overview of the key themes um, and issues around open access, is a recent e overview of all the studies, and it definitely identified a broad citation advantage for researchers who publish openly. And this increase in citation and impact is in fact one reason my most publishers now have some open, open access journals that they publish and or they of, offer open access on a per article basis. Last fall there was a Twitter thread started by Michael Eisen who's one of the founders of the Public Library of Science and it was raise your hand if you've ever wanted to read an article you couldn't access. Um, and these are some of the responses in these tweets and they highlight you know the greater good uh, reasons for open access that it benefits science, education, and society as a whole. And, and that's because not all institutions have access to the journals that they need. It affects researchers, students, teachers, people resort resort to workarounds to access the con that content that they need to do science. Um, physicians, patient advocates, families, citizen scientists without affiliation, they have a legitimate need to access publicly funded research. Um, and shouldn't we all have access as taxpayers who have funded much of the published research? Um, so this brings us to the question, why is it like this? Why is it so difficult to access this information? And to answer that question, you have to look at the economics of the scholarly communication system, um, which favor the status quo. The status quo is a situation where the content creators, the faculty authors, are insulated from the costs of this whole process because libraries are the intermediaries and usually they license the journal subscriptions. Publishers control the content because they acquire the copyright. Um, from the authors, and they've managed to do this, you know, well into the electronic um, journal system. As a consequence, publishers can charge high prices for the journals. They have um, low overhead some, a lot of the time, and now no materials costs compared to the print world. Journal subscriptions have increased consistently at a rate of five to seven percent per year, which is much higher than the consumer price index. Um, in addition, the consolidation of the public publishing industry over the, 30, of the last 30 years has led to an increase in profits for the publishers. So today there are five publishers who dominate the science, technology, medicine market, and together they uh, have a 52% share of the market. Um, so as you can see on the slide, scholarly publishing is big money with huge profit margins. And, the ram so, and there are ramifications to this. Um, full text access is limited to those who can afford it. Um, scholarly publishing is entrenched um, in these legacy systems with very successful companies, so the process has remained unchanged. Um, and the current system is perpetuated by the current academic reward system, where um, pro uh, promotion and tenure is tied to researchers getting published in high-impact journals published by these publishers. So the publishers have all the leverage. And unfortunately, it appears that the current trends that, that we've just talked about are going to continue. Um, but the hope is that eventually open access will be a democratizing force and help bring balance to the system. So how do we achieve uh, that balance? There are generally considered to be two roads or mechanisms to, uh, for making scholarship open, green open access and gold open access. Gold open access is publication through open access journals or in subscription journals that offer an immediate open access option to authors. And green access is through self-archiving and open access repositories. And we'll talk about each of these in a little more detail.
So open access journals um, generally perform peer review just like subscription journals, and, but then they make their contents freely available to the world without um, subscriptions. And some examples of journals in this environment are PLOS, the Public Library of Science, and uh, Biomed Central is another open access journal publisher. And there are now more than 9,000 fully open access, peer reviewed uh, open access journals in the world according to the Directory of Open Access Journals, which is about one third of all published journals right now. This is how it works, which is very simple in, our, in outline. Um, the hard part is selecting the journal because not all open access journals are created equal, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. Uh, the Directory of Open Access Journals, the link is on the slide, is a great resource for selecting um, an open access journal for a discipline. And regarding the article processes charges and um, the second point there, so open access publishing has become associated with a pay to publish model. But according to um, DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, 70% um, of peer reviewed open access journals do not charge an APC. Um, this is a bit different in biology, medicine, and medicine where the ratio is more like 50 50. And these article processing charges are meant to cover the cost of publishing upfront, editing, peer review, um, but they are highly variable and range from as low as $20 or zero all the way up to over $5,000 for some journals with the average being about $900 to $1,000. And where does the money come to pay for these? Um, a variety of places. Um, some publishers such as Biomed Central offer institutional memberships which provide discounts. Um, other publishers offer a site license discount. Um, if you already subscribe to their journal, then they'll lower the price for the article processing fee. Um, there are co campus open access funds at some institutions or departmental open access funds to pay. Um, you can be an individual member you know, to a journal or an organization and get a discount. Um, the author can pay out of pocket or more, more likely in almost all these scenarios is authors are using their grant money to pay for the article processing charges. So there have always been vanity presses and publishers who are more interested in the bottom line than in upholding ideals of research and scholarship. And open access is simply one more way that questionable publishers can take advantage of the system. So we now have what are called predatory publishers um, who are scam publishers seeking to exploit the author pays model that's um, used in open access and exploiting the author's needs to publish for their own gain. So these publishers seek out content and they'll publish anything as long as you pay the fee. So common talk tactics that they use, um, they accept articles with little or no peer review. Um, they inform authors about the fee only after the article's been accepted. Uh, they aggressively solicit for article submissions. Um, and it looks like according to a 2015 study, which is the uh, image on the slide, there's been a big increase in these taxes. And that, it's rather stunning, <laughs> the, um, the slide. Most researcher, researchers that I've talked to have been solicited by open access publishers, these kind of predatory publishers. Students are solicited, librarians are solicited. We're all, we're all getting those emails. Um, and unfortunately, predatory publishing gives a bad name to the mostly good and respectable open access publishers. Um, and related to the, sort of the predatory practices, there's a perception that open access journals are intrinsically low in quality. Um, but in fact, again, most are peer reviewed, um, just like, you know, subscription access journals. Um, and there are some that have a very high impact factor um, in a wide range of disciplines. Um, PLOS biology and PLOS pathogens are in the top five for the discipline. Um, Biomed Central's journals, genome biology, BMC biology, and BMC medicine are all in the top 10 in their disciplines in terms of impact. So what can we do to make sure that we choose a good open access journal um, for publishing our research? 
Um, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, who obviously has um, a, a good incentive to do this, has developed a checklist um, to help researchers identify trusted journals. And their checklist includes some of the questions that you can see on the slide. Um, for instance, you probably don't want to publish in a journal that you've never read any articles from. Yeah. Let's kind of start from there. So back to our roads to open access, the other mechanism for making scholarship open is green open access or archiving, self-archiving in, op in open access repositories. So the, the act of depositing a paper in an open archive or repository um, other than the publisher's website is called green open access and this is self-archiving. Um, these repositories are generally disciplinary or institutional repositories. They don't perform peer review, they just make their contents available um, to the world, freely available. Um, PubMed Central and Archive are two examples of open repositories. Uh, institutions often have their own open access archives for showcasing their scholarship. And the repository at, here at UMass Medical School, eScholarship e at UMMS, is an example of an open institutional repository. And this is how self-archiving works. Um, for this, for this, for green open access, authors really have to be motivated. They have to be interested in, and want to participate in, in self-archiving. Or they need to be compelled by funder or publisher, <laughs> by funder mandates or local policies. Um, so to find out a publisher's policies for self-archiving for a particular paper, um, you can start by looking up the journal title at the Sherpa Romeo website, which is a searchable database of policies in this area. And it includes links to relevant information on publisher websites. And right now, about 79% um, of publishers, according to Sherpa Romeo, allow authors to self-archive some version of their papers um, in uh, open access repositories. And typically this is the postprint, which would be the um, author created version after it's been accepted for publication. Um, and librarians can help um, you determine the publisher policy and an appropriate repositor repository and can even help you publish your uh, deposit your paper, not publish and deposit. <laughs> Although we can publish too. Um, <laughs> so there's been a slow but steady growth uh, in green open access in this self-archiving and much of it's been driven by funder mandates and institutional policies. Um, for example, um, researchers funded by the National Institutes of Health are compelled to self-archive their papers in PubMed Central in order to, com to comply with the NIH's public as access policy or they risk losing their funding. Um, the result of this, as you can see on the slide, is that there has been um, a big increase in PubMed of freely available um, articles to now it was 34% back in 2008, it's now over to 71%. So big, big, big difference. Um, and also in response to that scholarly communication landscape that we talked about, institutions are also now um, adopting policies or mandates that request or even require their researchers to provide open access to their peer reviewed research articles by depositing it in usually that institution's um, open access repository. And currently, more than 500 institutions, um, universities and research institutions have implemented such policies. If you want to learn more about publishing open access, the Scholarly Publication and Academic Resources Coalition, um, SPARC, um, has a lot of resources to, that explain your rights um, at the, as an author. Um, on the slide, there are some ideas about what you can do. I would say, you know, to start with, make sure you read your author rights and any publisher agreements. Um, read about your author rights and, um, you know, ask your librarian if you need um, uh, some help in understanding what it is they're asking because they can be very legalese. Um, you can also submit an addendum that allows you to, um, you know, that you, where you, indicate that you're asserting your right to post your article in a repository. Copyright is an author's right, it's not a publisher's right, so you don't need to sign it away. Um, 
open access will improve only if the producers and the consumers participate um, in the process. It, it, this means actively engaging in the publishing process, recognizing and calling out predatory practices, taking the time to comply with funder mandates. Um, open access really is a goal worth pursuing. So now let's move on to open data and data sharing. Um, so the open access movement um, has led to calls for increased open data and data sharing. And by open data, um, we mean data that can be freely used, reused, redistributed by anyone, um, subject at most only to the requirement to attribute or maybe share it in the same way. Um, at first, the, um, the movement for open data was focused on government data, but now um, it has very much moved so that open scientific data is also a goal. And this uh, 2010 quote from the Pan Principles is one of the earliest articulations of the need for open data. And, and note the similarities to what open access advocates um, are striving for. You know, it's freely available without barriers, basically. There is a high degree of overlap between the concepts of open access, open data, and data sharing. Um, and data sharing is the practice of making your research data available to others for validation and replication of the results. Um, data sharing goes back centuries. You know, scientists have always shared their data with other scientists. Um, but what is new is the idea of disseminating it widely to the public um, via the internet. And the idea of sharing data strictly as a valuable research output in its own right, and not just as a supplement to a paper, um, and sharing data with the public at large is only you know, a few decades old. So data sharing um, builds on efforts taken earlier uh, in the research life cycle, as shown in this diagram from the University of Virginia. And effective data sharing requires careful thought during each stage of the process that you see on the image. You know, you need to describe and document the data collection process and your content. Um, you want to archive the data in a location from which it can be accessed or shared. Um, you want to preserve the data in a format um, that enables long-term reuse. Um, and you want to make your data discoverable by publishing information about the data in research publications, um, adding it to portals, things like that. The open data movement and the focus on increasing access to government-funded research data as a matter of public good, as well as concerns about increasing transparency and reproducibility, have led to funders requiring data management plans uh, and to publishers establishing requirements around the availability and retention of data. Um, there's also the Freedom of Information Act, which stipulates that data produced um, during an award must be available to the public, but this act is generally used by citizens to gain access to data that's not publicly available or used to gain access to data um, produced by the government. But data sharing also leads to important benefits for researchers, um, some of which are listed here, and we'll review these um, in more detail. Published uh, articles, as it says on the slide, with shared data sets receive more citations than articles without the shared data. Um, a study in 2013 found a statistically significant 9% increase in citation um, between papers that had available data sets archived and those that did not. So if you want more citations for your articles, share the data that supports the articles. That's the message there. Um, and if you share your data, it can be cited, just like journal articles are cited. Um, and data requires citations for the same reasons journal articles and other types of publications require them, to acknowledge the original author or producer and to help other researchers find the resource. Um, Dataset is an organization whose goal is to help the res research community locate, identify, and cite data with confidence. And they say that citing data is important because it enables easy reuse and verification of the data, allows the impact to be tracked, and creates a scholarly structure that recognizes and rewards the producers of the data. 
Thomson Reuters, the producer of the Web of Science products, is indexing data citations from repositories around the world in their data citation index product. This is another important step for data citation and data sharing. Unfortunately, uh, standards for citing data are not uniformly agreed upon yet. Um, so authors should cite data according to you know, journal guidelines, uh, professional guidelines that they have, style manuals such as um, the APA or NLM citing medicine provide some guidance. Repositories often also um, provide guidance on how to cite their data sets. Um, but if you don't have any guidance, you can um, use data sites recommended format, which is shown on the slide, where you simply indicate who the creator is, the year the data set was published, the title of it, the publisher, which in many cases is considered to be the repository, and an identifier, such as a URL or a DOI. Sharing data openly um, may lead to collaborations that may not have been possible just from um, publishing the articles alone. And so this is another reason um, why data sharing is a benefit to researchers. Um, researchers can also be um, more efficient and save time and money because they're not recreating work already done. And I think that sharing data also is an incentive to researchers um, to ensure they engage in better data documentation, which is helpful to all of us. And and also, data can be used to stimulate innovation. It creates new markets for services relating to the curation of data, its preservation, analysis, and uh, visualization. Data sharing also enhances transparency and reproducibility. So the goal of transparency is to uh, reduce academic fraud, things such as falsifying research and fabricating data. It's harder to fake the data if it's available publicly. And the Retraction Watch website tracks papers that have been um, retracted because of academic fraud, and there are a lot. The, the link on the slide is to their retraction count for Diedrich Staple, who's a Dutch social psychology researcher, who has now notched 58 retractions for fabricating data. He's, they actually have a leaderboard of, of people who have the most retractions, and he's number four on the list right now. Um, papers are also retracted because of reproducibility issues, and, and this is one of the primary um, drivers um, for data sharing and data management initiatives and policies from the government, and, and there have been many reports of selecting, selective reporting of results, insufficient documentation of research methods, researchers unable to reproduce their own experiments. Um, and as an example, um, the other image on the slide um, that looks like Stephen Colbert um, is actually about Thomas Herndon, who's a UMass graduate student in economics. And he made national headlines when, as part of a course he was taking, he found errors in the data set of two extremely influential Harvard researchers, and he wrote a paper about it. And these errors would never have been uncovered, probably, if they um, if, they, if their data hadn't been available for him to look at as part of this course. So the, the video, if you have a chance to watch the video, um, is of Herndon being interviewed by Stephen Colbert. It's really funny. It's a, it's a good interview. Uh, so my point is that publicly sharing data coding materials can certainly improve reproducibility. And these data sharing policies, requirements from funders and publishers help us get there. In general, the specific requirements from publishers uh, are about the availability, submission, and retention of data uh, that supports conclusions that they are publishing in their journals. In 2014, the publisher PLOS, the Public Library of Science, they led the charge and implemented a stronger data sharing policy for their journals. And since then, other journals have implemented or are planning to implement similar data policies. There are different methods of sharing data publicly. Um, with publication, it often depends on the journal. Um, a journal can require it as a supplement that they would publish on their website. Or um, in many cases, particularly for uh, genomics data, things like that, they expect the researcher to make the data available um, through an established repository um, in that discipline. There could be an embargo or delay placed 
on the data, though most expectations are that the data um, should be available immediately. And so before this happens, researchers want to make sure that they've um, followed through on the research life cycle and that the data is clean, that quality control measures have been taken place, the data is documented properly. The most effective way to share data publicly is to deposit it in a data repository, either an institutional repository or a disciplinary repository. So if you want to or need to share a data set that accompanies a published paper, how do you choose a repository? Um, there are some things that you can um, uh, consider. Uh, th there's a checklist on the slide. You know, does the journal that you're publishing with make any re recommendations? Um, do researchers in your discipline, you know, often use um, a specific repository? Do you have an institutional repository um, at your institution? Um, if none of those um, considerations work out for you, there, is, there are a couple of registries of research data repositories that you can search to find one that might be useful to you. Uh, many journals also now provide recommended lists of repositories, um, such as the links to PLOS and, and um, Nature that you can see. In general, the journals don't dictate which repository you should use. Um, they encourage you to select one that's the most appropriate um, for your research. And you would just want to make sure that the repository also collects metrics on usage of your data and shares them with you. That's important. And you'll see in the next section. And if you're struggling, librarians can also help you identify an appropriate repository. When choosing a repository, look for one that assigns a permanent, unique identifier to your data. Um, URLs can change over time, um, but a permanent ID will always paint to the point to the same object even if the URL changes. The most um, commonly used identifier is the DOI, which stands for Digital Object Identifier. Um, DOIs have been used for journal articles for years, and they're now regularly being assigned to other kinds of research products, um, including data. There are a surprising number of subject and multidisciplinary repositories for scientific data. The R3 data registry now lists 1,500, if you can believe that. Um, an established open repository for your subject or discipline is the best choice if one's available um, because it's recognized and trusted within your community and it specializes in your type of data. Examples of disciplinary repositories are GenBank for sequencing data, GEO for genomics data, ICPSR for social sciences data. You can locate uh, data repositories for many other disciplines using the resources on the previous slide. But if there is no specialized community endorsed open repository for your discipline, there are uh, a number, a growing number of general data repositories and platforms available that can handle a wide variety of data. Uh, some of these options, uh, Dryad and Figshare in particular, are integrated into publisher workflows and are available from within the submission process for journals. So that's becoming more common. Nature, for example, works with both Dryad and Figshare in that way. Uh, Figshare is a commercial product which uses the freemium business model. So the core services are free, but if you want premium services, there is, there is a charge. Um, my institution also um, licenses an electronic lab notebook product, um, which includes the functionality for data sharing, so that may also be an option for you at your institution. There are also institutional repositories whose purpose is to collect, showcase, make more visible, and archive scholarly products authored by their faculty, staff, and students um, in a stable, open, easily accessible repository. Um, an example here is the repository at UMass Medical School. Uh, institutional repositories will only accept publications um, or data gener generated by researchers from the same institution. Um, so you may have um, a similar repository at your institution, and so consult your librarians to find out. Um, just make sure that the repository adheres to best practices for responsible data sharing. Um, such as preservation, in regard to preservation, citation, and openness in order to be suitable. 
In the last few years, data journals have emerged. So these are journals that exclusively focus on publishing data sets in order to expose and share the research data and to promote its reuse. Um, scientific data and, and giga science are established data journals. They've been around for a few years, and there are a number um, of others as well, um, if you check the link. I'll finish up this section with a recommendation um, to read this article about nine simple ways to make it easier to reuse your data. Um, the author's recommendations focus on making your data understandable, easy to an analyze, and readily available to the wider community of scientists. There's some great tips in there. So the final section of the, our presentation is about tracking impact of, of research data. So open data is all about quality, transparency, increasing efficiency, widening the opportunities for academic research through data sharing. So if we're making this data available in repositories, then we need to be able to track its um, research impact. The traditional benchmarks for this have been citation-based metrics, um, things like the journal impact factor and the H index or the Hirsch index, although there are many other citation-based measures as well. But increasingly, research impact has become greater than citation-based metrics alone. We are seeing that the citation-based metrics give an incomplete picture of impact, and they miss newer forms of, of usage, such as page views, download counts, mentions, and saves that provide just not academic impact, but also scientific uh, societal impact. Um, Article-level metrics, also known as um, alt metrics, or alternative metrics are stepping in to fill these gaps and becoming more mainstream. Publishers, networking uh, platforms, repositories are actively collecting um, and displaying this data that captures the digital footprint of research that we all leave behind when we click on things on the internet. So metrics are important. They measure our influence in our communities. They're used to evaluate the performance of ourselves, our departments, our peers. Therefore, ensuring that we collect relevant measures and contextualize them appropriately is important. Um, also, as funding for scientific research becomes harder to obtain, the ability to demonstrate and document real value and outcomes of funded projects becomes important. Um, research funders want tangible evidence um, of benefit to weigh against the costs of research. And they, they tend to take into account a wide variety of ways in which your research can be influential. Um, measuring the impact of data also benefits researchers. It gives them a deeper understanding of their impact beyond citations, beyond anecdotal evidence. The same metrics that are tracked for journal articles can also be tracked for data. Uh, I recommend the two resources listed on the slide if you want to delve further into <coughs> impact measurement concepts. The Becker model has been particularly influential. Um, but as far as the metrics go, um, as we said, citations, data sets are starting to get indexed and cited to credit the data producers. Um, the other metrics on the slide are generally considered alternative metrics. Um, Resolutions refers to the usage of unique identifiers like DOIs. Whenever somebody actually clicks, clicks on one, then that, um, is, that use is counted. Um, page views and downloads from web server logs, from repositories and journal websites. Um, these are all getting counted. You know, downloads generally indicate a stronger interest than a page view. Um, social media links to Twitter, Mendeley, resources like that. Digital badges are a recent development um, implemented by a handful of um, journals. And so they work like this. The badges can be assigned to indicate how authors contributed to a data set, you know, displayed on the journal's web page. So the contributions include things like conceptualizing the project, testing, methodology, writing. Um, there are, like, there are just 10, just for this paper right here, you can see 10 that were um, assigned to the authors here. And a handful of journals um, are using these now, um, including the data, data journal Giga Science that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And there was an interesting study that was just published 
the journal Psychological Science found that when they instituted badges like this for open data, the proportion of articles stating that data were available shot up to 40 percent, whereas before it had been under 10 percent. And Nature actually published a news story um, about this study. There are a number of tools and services for tracking research impact metrics for all kinds of research products, um, including data. They package and display um, the metrics in various ways. Some are free to use, some are for profit and tar targeted at institutions. And these are some of the players. Um, the Public Library of Science actually it was, is a pioneer in alt metrics. They were one of the first journals to give its authors access to article level metrics. Um, single user tools like Impact Story have emerged as a way for researchers to capture all their impact in one place. You create a profile, and we'll all show that. Um, companies like Altmetric have developed applications that demonstrate how Altmetric data can enhance bibliometric data through integration with databases like Scopus and other websites. They have a bookmarklet that you can embed in your browser, and so whenever you go to a paper on the internet, um, you can actually see if it has all metric data if you're using their bookmarklet. And tools like PlumX um, is a bit higher level. They summarize and, and compare the impact and quality of not only individuals, but research centers, departments, and the institution as a whole. So I just wanted to show a few slides of these tools in action. Um, this is from altmetric.com's uh, <clears throat> tool. So this is a data set, three PDF images of a gigantic dinosaur, which were deposited um, in Figshare. And you can see the various um, mentions, you know, blogs, new, news outlets, and other sources were tracked by Altmetric. This um, data set had a DOI, which made it easier to track. And they calculate a score, that's the 185, um, it's calculated from the volume of mentions, and it's weighted according to the type of mention. Um, newspaper articles are given more in, uh, weight than tweets, for instance, that sort of thing. So it's very interesting. Um, and Impact Story is a product where you create a profile for yourself, and you can track the impact of each of your publications. Um, so this is an example of um, Impact Story metrics. At, Note on the left the range of scholarly products that can be tracked. It's got articles, data sets, figures, posters, slide decks, software products, theses. The blue color represents usage by scholars, and the green represents usage by the public. Uh, I think it's interesting that the lab notebook, and also the, the, both of these um, particular papers, including the lab notebook, they're highly viewed and highly discussed by both um, audiences. It's pretty interesting. And, and this is a closer look at the lab notebook. Um, so you can see exactly where, you know, who is looking at, um, looking at this data. So it helps, you know, make, as we said before, add more meaning and context to things like download codes. So you can see that this sort of information can be very powerful for researchers. But using quantitative measures for assessing impact is not without controversy, just like everything else. Um, researchers are not happy about being in a culture of measurement. It affects them in a negative way. Um, you know, this is a, a new and emerging area, and so due to the immaturity of, of some of the products, um, some of the measurements, you know, might not be comparable. Um, you really need to understand the weaknesses and the strengths of the data that you're looking at and where it's coming from. Uh, also, you know, the metrics don't talk about quality. It's just about impact. It doesn't mean because you have a lot of tweets that it's a good paper necessarily or a good piece of data. Um, a lot of researchers still believe that, that this is trivial, that these um, measurements, you know, don't really mean that much. Um, that they don't measure true impact. And, and I, I think you know, that, that's changing, but a lot of folks are, are, are concerned about that. Um, also, the impact can be exaggerated through gaming and data manipulation, although the um, providers work hard to combat this. 
and um, citation-based traditional metrics are susceptible to gaming too. These metrics can be difficult to interpret. We're relying on third-party data sources and their complex algorithms. Um, it can only be accurate if the name, the information about you know, the producer of the data and, um, and, it, and the object itself is accurate. So certainly these metrics have limitations um, and, and you need to use caution when you use them, but they can be very useful. The, the Becker website, the link on the slide, has a great list of strategies for how you can increase your impact. Um, and I'll just go over through these briefly. Um, ORCID is an initiative to address the common problem of author um, misidentification in scholarly communication. There are many authors with the same name, same initials, who've changed their name during the course of their careers. So you can register for a free ORCID, which is, which is a unique author ID, sort of like a DOI, and list your publications on your ORCID profile. So just make sure you're consistent in how you list your name on publications, include what your ORCID when submitting a paper or a data set or other research object. Include it in your email signature on your personal web page. Um, using an ORCID makes it easier for publishers and databases to track your metrics. Make sure you deposit your data in a trustworthy repository. You know, one um, that has a stable location that can be cited and which collects metrics. Um, make sure that your data set has enough metadata so it's discoverable, understandable, and reusable. Um, a license, um, you want to create an unambiguous statement about, about what uses are permitted and allay any concerns from researchers who might want to use your data. Um, and, and the big thing is awareness. Get the word out. Draw attention to your data set. Tweet about it. Cite it in any publications that draw on it. Mention it on networking sites. Um, you know, add your impact data to your CV or your bio sketch or your promotion package. If you want to seriously pursue all metrics, the, um, the ebook shown on the slide, the free 30 day impact challenge, is a great resource to learn more. So, thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you've been convinced that making research data openly accessible benefits all of us, including uh, the researchers themselves.